apply Digger. Heidegger's thinking in being and time explained with Simon Critchley. Episode 11, Death. I'm speaking to you from the city of death that New York has become. The first 10 episodes of Applydiger were recorded in the studio of my friend and producer, Zenon Marco. But we can't do that anymore because we're in lockdown and we're all self-isolating. So I'm going to take you through Division 2 of Being in Time uh, in a slightly different place, in a different mood. Um, The place is at home in Brooklyn, and the mood is the mood of fear, anxiety, hypochondria, and the dread of mortality that really defines this pandemic situation into which we've moved. And I don't want to argue for the contemporary relevance of Heidegger's thought to our time, but I'm going to do it anyway, because if ever there were a a moment to become an existential phenomenologist, um, then it is now, it seems to me. If ever there was a time in which the discussions of fear, anxiety, mortality being towards death, if ever there was a time when those things really resounded and made sense, then that time is now. And I want to take you through Division two of being in time in the most detailed and faithful way that I can manage. And I want to do more of a kind of full metal Heidegger for the remainder of these episodes. For those people that are still listening after all of these, uh, all of these weeks we've been, we've been doing this. And, um, the topic for this episode is being towards death. So let's get into it. Heidegger claims in paragraph 45 that the existential analytic has not been sufficiently primordial because it has been carried out at the level of Dasein's inauthentic average everydayness. An analysis of Dasein in its authenticity has been missing. So the first thing that's missing from the preparatory analysis that's going to be made up for in Division 2 is a discussion of authenticity. The second thing that's missing is an analysis of Dasein that truly takes Dasein into view or keeps Dasein in view as a whole. In order to see the whole, we need to see the end of Dasein and grasp it. Follow Heidegger's logic here. The question is a question of the whole, and to grasp the whole, we need to see the end and grasp the end of Dasein. That end is death. And therefore, what is required is an analysis of Dasein's relation to its end, its being towards death. So these are the two problems that propel the analysis of division two authenticity and totality, authenticity and totality. We might ask uh, why these two themes? We might ask why the end of Dasein and not the beginning of Dasein? Why death and not birth? But let's just take it as it is. The problem of wholeness leads to being towards death and to the full existential conception of being towards death. That's what Heidegger's after, the full existential conception of being towards death. 
The problem of authenticity or authentic totality, authentic being a whole, leads to conscience. And conscience is the ontic or existential attestation, a word that Heidegger uses repeatedly in these pages, attestation, testimony, uh, evidence of being towards death in the form of conscience. So two problems that initiate division two, the problem of authenticity and the problem of totality, uh, seeing things as a whole. And this leads to an analysis of uh, conscience and analysis of being towards death. And the relationship between conscience and being towards death is a relationship between the ontic, conscience, and the ontological, being towards death. And we'll come back to that in more detail. Let's just make a note of it now. With the analysis of being towards death and conscience completed, we will, Heidegger uh, assures us, be able to get Dasein into our grasp as an authentic potentiality for being a whole. An authentic potentiality for being a whole. And once he's got these two pieces in place, this is going to lead in the third division of chapter two to the concept of anticipatory resoluteness, where he'll bring being towards death and conscience together. But let's save that for a while. Once Heidegger has gone through being towards death, conscience, and brought the two things together. This will lead to a new determination of the being of care seen from the perspective of temporality. So he's going to look at care from the perspective of temporality and repeat, repeat the whole analysis of everydayness that we saw in Division 1. And that's, going to, that's what's going to take place in chapters three and four of division two. Then in chapter five of division two, he's going to look at the question of historicity, the relation of Dasein to historicity. And he's going to finish the book with an analysis of the relation between the time of Dasein, or what he prefers to call the temporality of Dasein, and vulgar traditional time what he calls time reckoning. So that's the, that's the menu for Division 2. And like all menus, when you go to a restaurant, uh, all those restaurants are closed now, of course, but like a menu when you go to a restaurant, that menu tells you nothing about what you're going to eat. Um, so let's try and fill things out. One other thing to notice on 45 is that there's an entirely unjust little footnote reference to Kierkegaard that sneaked in at the end of paragraph 45. And if you want to uh, chase that through, it's on page 494. And on page 494, I'm flicking to the page now. He says the following. Oh yeah, this is good, because this is so unfair. Heidegger says, this is page 494, footnote 6, Roman. In the 19th century, Sir and Kierkegaard explicitly seized upon the problem of existence as an existential problem and thought it through in a penetrating fashion. Hmm. But the existential problematic was so alien to him that as regards his ontology, he remained completely dominated by Hegel and by ancient philosophy, as Hegel saw it. Thus, there is more to be learned philosophically from his edifying writings than from his um, theoretical ones, with the exception of his treatise on the concept of anxiety. Anyway, if you're interested in Kierkegaard, you could unpack that. It's kind of condemning with faint praise. He sees, um, Heidegger sees Kierkegaard as an existential thinker who's uh, still captive to Hegel and Hegel's view of ancient philosophy, and kind of you know, philosophically not up to par, as it were. That could easily be, be flattened as a remark 
But these are the ways in which Heidegger repays his debts to the people that he's borrowed things from, namely pretty poorly. Okay, now we're going to move on to Division 2, Chapter 1, Being Towards Death, um, which feels all too relevant and contemporary at this moment. But let's just leave that to one side. Now, Being Towards Death, these pages are extraordinarily exciting and when i was rereading them trying to reread them in the last few days i was uh, strangely excited almost overwhelmed uh, by them uh, which itself is kind of worrying but there's something you know in these pages it's like reading the devil himself or herself and as william blake said the devil always gets the best lines so there's something really um powerful in um, this analysis of being towards death. The issue that Heidegger is going to try and raise is how we get Dasein into our grasp as a whole. And to get Dasein into our grasp as a whole, as I've said before, we need to have a grasp on the end of Dasein. The end of Dasein is death. Therefore, we need to have an understanding of death, of being towards death. Um, the key thing in this chapter like with much of Heidegger, but maybe particularly in this chapter, is to get the basic arguments that Heidegger's making into our grasp as a whole and not get bogged down in detail. The detail is fascinating, but distracting. So we're going to try and pull out the, the big picture arguments. And I want to do that in an unusual way. I want to divide the chapter into two parts. And those two parts are the first part of the chapter, paragraphs 47 to 49, and the second part of the chapter, um, paragraphs 50 to 53. And I want to look at the second half of the chapter first. And you'll see why I'm doing it this way by the end of this episode, I promise you. So let me give an overview of Heidegger's conception of being towards death based on paragraphs 50 to 53, the kind of culmination of the chapter. Now, in paragraph 50, Heidegger gives a preliminary sketch of the existential ontological structure of death as, and we're going to come back to these words, a number of times, as non-relational and not to be outstripped. Non-relational and not to be outstripped. We'll come back to those terms and explain them. Let's just leave them hanging in the air for a second. The key passage here I want to begin with is on page 294-295. And this is what Heidegger writes on 294 towards the bottom of the page. He says, death is the possibility of the impossibility of Dasein. Thus death reveals itself as that possibility which is one's own most, which is non-relational, and which is not to be outstripped. As such, death is something distinctively impending. Its existential possibility is based on the fact that Dasein is essentially disclosed to itself and disclosed indeed as ahead of itself. This item in the structure of care has its most primordial concretion in being towards death. As a phenomenon, being towards the end becomes plainer as being towards that distinctive possibility of Dasein which we have characterized. Now, non-relationality. Non-relationality means that in standing before death, Dasein, us, stands before its own most possibility. And as such, in standing before our being towards death, it's cut off all relations to other 
human beings, other Daseins. More precisely, Dasein has undone those relations. In my view, this is a problem. I'm going to come back to it. The Dasein's relationship to death is a relationship to its own death, to, to my death. It does not relate primarily to the deaths of others, but to my own death as my own most death that is my death for me. So non-relationality means that I cannot understand death through a relation to another, but only by relation to my own death. And we will come back to that, believe me. Not to be outstripped means that death is death. Right? Not to be outstripped means that there's no way of trumping death. Death outstrips all possibilities because it is the possibility of the impossibility of Dasein. That is, it is the inability that is the limit against which my ability is to be measured, right? Think about this. So Dasein is really understood by Heidegger as, in its authentic mode, as potentiality. Dasein is the being that is able. In relation to death, my potentiality, my potency shatters itself against an impotence, something that I'm not able to do. Death is the limit of my virility of being, but I'm virile towards that impotence. I'm putting that in terms of virility because that's the way in which thinkers like Levinas and also Luce uh, Irigaray will characterize Dasein. Dasein. Dasein's being is a being virile. But that virility is always measured against the impotentiality of death. So that's 50. 51. In paragraph 51, Heidegger contrasts being towards death with everyday death or how death is conceived in the they self by them. And how it's conceived by them is in terms of evasion or fleeing in the face of death. For das man, for the they, we could say, Heidegger says, man stirbt, one dies. Death is a mishap that happens to one, but not to me in particular. Think of here of the um, the gravestone of uh, the artist, the great artist, uh, Master Duchamp, which reads something like, c'est les autres qui meurent, n'est-ce pas? It's other people that die. No, n'est-ce pas? That is to say, with the they, with the one, with the they, with average everydayness, we evade death and conceal it in our solicitude and in our consolation. Death happens to us all. Death, if it death happens, it's in the hands of God or whatever. Namely, the, the they tranquilizes us in relation to death. Tranquilizes us. And there's an interesting moment in, um, in Being in Time where on page 298, which is a great page, if you get a chance to look at it closely, on page 298, we get a footnote reference to Tolstoy. And Tolstoy is the death of Ivan Illich. And there's been um, some discussion of that footnote and the relationship to the death of others in relation to Tolstoy and the way Heidegger cites that as a piece by... My old PhD advisor, Robert Bernasconi, on that very topic. But if you look at the, um, just before the footnote, which mentions Tolstoy, that's on 298, um, Heidegger makes the, I think, powerful remark where he says, there is, um, you know, the they 
uh, provides a constant tranquilization about death. You know, think about that in terms of tranquilization, in terms of, you know, prayers and thoughts, prayers and thoughts, tranquilization. And he completes that first paragraph on 298, 298 by saying, even indeed the dying of others is seen often enough as a social inconvenience, if not even a downright tactlessness against which the public is to be guarded. Right? So the other's death is something kind of inconvenient that gets in the way, something a little bit tactless, something we'd rather not have to deal with. And then he says a little bit further down on 298, he says, um, it's the beginning of the last paragraph on 298, 298. But temptation, tranquilization, and alienation are distinguishing marks of the kind of being called falling. As falling, every day being towards death is a constant fleeing in the face of death. Being towards the end has the mode of evasion in the face of it, giving new explanations for it, understanding it inauthentically, and concealing it. So even in inauthentic, average, everydayness, which is premised upon the evasion of death, the inconvenience of death, the denial of death, as Ernst Becker uh, would have said, death is still there, sleepingly. It's still there, sleepingly top of page 299, completing this run of thought, Heidegger says, even in average everydayness, this almost potentiality for being, which is non-relational and not to be outstripped, is constantly an issue for Dasein. This is the case when its concern is merely in the mode of an untroubled indifference towards the uttermost possibility of existence. Average, everyday existence flees, evades death. Now we're on 52. In paragraph 52, we get the full existential ontological conception of being towards death. Sounds like a kind of heavy metal album, doesn't it? Full existential ontological conception of being towards death, where the two criteria that we've already seen, non-relationality and not to be outstrippedness, death is my death and death is not to be outstripped, is pretty important, are supplemented by two further criteria, certainty and indeterminacy or indefiniteness, we could say. Death is certain, death is indefinite. So firstly, death is certain. Nobody doubts that they die, do they? Does anybody doubt that they die? I hope not. Maybe Simon Cowell doubts that he dies. I don't know, maybe Madonna. Nobody doubts that they die. It's certain that we're going to die. So the they self, as what William Blake would call the nobo daddy, the nobo daddy, the they self, although it can evade and flee in the face of death because it's just inconvenient and tactless, still cannot doubt the certainty of death. So any full conception of being towards death will have to admit four criteria, right? So let's see them, those criteria spelled out on page 303. Here we are on page 303, top of the page. Second line on page 303. The full existential ontological conception of death may now be defined as follows. Death as the end of Dasein is death's, is Dasein's almost possibility, non-relational, certain, and as such indefinite, not to be outstripped. Death is, as Dasein's end, 
in the being of this entity towards its end. So those are the four criteria by which Heidegger defines the full conception of being towards death. Death is non-relational. It's um, not to be outstripped. It is certain and it is indefinite. I'm going to come back to those four criteria in the kind of second half of this lecture. But you'll already perhaps guess where I'm going to press. I'm going to press on the notion of non-relationality. I think that's the real problem in Heidegger. But that's to come in a little while. If I am towards my end, then I am already in relation to my not yet. Right? If I am towards my end, then I am. My being is already a being towards something not yet. The not yet of the future and the futurity of death in particular. This being my not yet was already there in the notion of being ahead of oneself in the structure of care, right? the first element in the structure of care, being ahead of oneself, the notion of running ahead of oneself. But if this is true, then even inauthentic Dasein has a relation to its running ahead, um, even when that's thought in the manner of fleeing. So what about an inauthentic understanding of being towards death. Heidegger says on 303, let's see if I can find this. This is a long, a long quotation. Yeah. Meanwhile, he says, 303, meanwhile, it remains questionable whether this problem has been as yet adequately worked out. Being towards death is grounded in care. Dasein is thrown being in the world, has in every case already been delivered over to its death. In being towards its death, Dasein is dying factically and indeed constantly, as long as it has not yet come to its demise. What we can say, when, when we say that Dasein is factically dying, we're saying at the same time that in its being towards death, Dasein has always decided itself in one way or another. Our everyday falling evasion in the face of death is an inauthentic being towards death. But inauthenticity is based on the possibility of authenticity. You might remember that we quoted those lines in... Um, episode four, or indeed lecture four, in what seems like another lifetime, when we were thinking about the relationship between inauthenticity and authenticity. Because at the end of um, chapter four, Heidegger describes authenticity as a modification of our inauthentic everyday lives. Here, he says the opposite. He says that inauthenticity is based on the possibility of authenticity. So these two terms, authenticity and inauthenticity, kind of spin around in uh, Heidegger's analysis, as we've already seen. In many ways, what gives this, this book its um, power, particularly in the second division, is the speed with which it was written. Heidegger wasn't able to fully control his thoughts and uh, moved uh, quickly. And there's a great virtue to moving quickly sometimes because certain things are revealed. Okay, we're going to move on now to paragraph 53. And paragraph 53 is majestic and really quite scarily powerful. So let's get into it. So in paragraph 53, Heidegger claims that this full conception of being towards death is still too formal 
and he links it to the possibility of authentic projection of being towards death. And it's here that Heidegger introduces what will become the key notion of anticipation. Anticipation, which he distinguishes from awaiting or expecting. The distinction in German is between das Vorlaufen, anticipation, running ahead, and erwarten, awaiting or expecting. And it's here that we get a very interesting specification of possibility, of the nature of possibility, and death as the possibility of impossibility. Now, Heidegger here and throughout being in time is running with a fully anti-Hegelian distinction a fully anti-Hegelian distinction between the possible and the actual. So that for Hegel, the real is the rational, the real is the, the actual, is the actual that has to concern us. For Heidegger, always it's possibility that stands higher than actuality. And his claim here is that the expectation of death or the awaiting of death still contains too much of the actual. So awaiting death, expecting death, expecting it to come, to take us away, to sweep us away with a, a droplet, with a vapor, with a virus or whatever. This still has too much of the actual for Heidegger. Whereas anticipation is pure possibility or anticipation to speak in a rather ugly way, but I think it's justified at this point. Anticipation is the possibilization of the possible, the possibilization of the possible or the condition of possibility of the possible. What makes the possible possible? So let's read a, a passage. This is on 306. And you can feel the, um, the language, the, the rhetoric in Heidegger's text uh, gathering in intensity and momentum. I think. This is going to be a longer quotation. So I'm on 306, and um, I'm going to begin the quote about two-thirds the way down on 306 and carry it over. So this is Heidegger. But being towards this possibility as being towards death is so to comport oneself towards death is so to comport oneself, I'm going to begin that again, but being towards this possibility as being towards death is so to comport oneself towards death that in this being and for it, death reveals itself as a possibility. Our terminology for such being towards this possibility is anticipation of this possibility. But in this way of behaving, does there not lurk a coming close of the possible? And when one is close to the possible, does not its actualization emerge? In this kind of coming close, however, one does not tend towards concernfully making available something actual, but as one comes closer understandingly, the possibility of the possible just becomes greater. The closest closeness which one may have in being towards death as a possibility is as far as possible from anything actual. The more unveiledly this possibility gets understood, the more purely does the understanding penetrate into it as the possibility of the impossibility of any existence at all. Death as possibility gives Dasein nothing to be actualized, nothing which Dasein as actual could itself be. It's the possibility of the impossibility of every way of comporting oneself towards anything, of every way of existing. In, this, in the anticipation of this possibility, it becomes greater and greater. Continuing the quotation, the beginning of the next paragraph 
on 307. Being towards death is the anticipation of a potentiality for being, of the entity whose kind of being is anticipation itself. In the anticipatory revealing of this potentiality for being, Dasein discloses itself to itself as regards its uttermost possibility. But to project itself on its own most potentiality for being means to be able to understand itself in the being of the entity so revealed, namely to exist. Anticipation turns out to be the possibility of understanding one's own most and uttermost potentiality for being. That is to say, the possibility of authentic existence. So, anticipation is the possibility of the possible. Anticipation is the possibility of the possible. That is, by projecting towards the possibility of impossibility, Dasein does not actualize any possibility, but makes the possibility of possibility greater and greater. Right? Being and time is a long hymn of praise to possibility, which is always higher than actuality for Heidegger. And the highest exemplification of possibility lies in being towards death. Dasein is possibility insofar as it authentically projects onto being towards death, Dasein comes into its own most. That is, what is most one's own is the projection of oneself into the multiplication of possibilities which one is not yet. This is the thought here. This is the thought. This is what you've got to catch hold of and um, use. Heidegger's thought is that one is that which is not yet. One is that not yet. And insofar as one is that not yet, the authentic projection of death as possibility shatters Dasein's inauthentic immersion in the they. It shatters it. On 263, he says, so this is page 307, this verb, shattering, wrenching, the, the kind of violence of the language here is um, really um, fascinating. So let me quote on 307. He says, death, death is Dasein's own most possibility. Being towards this possibility discloses to Dasein its own most potentiality for being, in which its very being is the issue. Here, it can become manifest to Dasein that in this distinctive possibility of its own self, it has been wrenched away from the they. Right? So, being towards death is the counter movement to falling, if we fall to the world, fall into the world, fall at the world, what happens in being towards death is that we're wrenched away, we're torn away. The verb in German is entrissen, which has an, a, you know, the sense of a riss, a, kind of a tear there. We're wrenched away from the they and we come into our own most possibility. So in being towards death, I arrest the movement of falling. I arrest the impersonal movement of falling to their world, the world of them. And I come into my own. I come into my own most, where my own is understood as being open to possibility. Right? I am possibility. Right? Insofar as I am not yet, I am in relationship to the not yet of my death. I am possibility. And death is what makes possibility possible within me. And that tears me away from average everydayness. 
Heidegger then interprets the four criteria for a full conception of being towards death from the stance of authenticity. I won't quote everything. I could quote all these pages because they're really powerful. But note that being towards death as anticipation, as my own most possibility, is non-relational. It lays claim to Dasein alone, as an individual. It singularizes me in relation to the demand of my finitude. It singularizes me. On page 308, Heidegger writes the first words on 308. The ownmost possibility is non-relational. Anticipation allows Dasein to understand that that potentiality for being in which its ownmost being is an issue must be taken over by Dasein alone. Death does not just belong to one's own Dasein in, in an undifferentiated way. Death lays claim to it as an individual Dasein. The non-relational character of death, as understood in anticipation, individualizes Dasein down to itself. The word finitude appears further down on the page, on page 308. Key word of finitude in an extraordinary passage where Heidegger speaks of the link between authentic individuation and the potentiality for the being of others. I'm going to quote this because it's really interesting. But look at what I've said so far, just really quickly, that death is my death. It's my relationship to my death, and that singularizes me. That is the demand of my finitude. So how do I relate to others on that basis? Page 308, about 10 lines up from the bottom of the page. Anticipation discloses to existence that its uttermost possibility lies in giving itself up, and thus it shatters all one's tenaciousness to whatever existence one has reached. In anticipation, Dasein guards itself against falling back behind itself or, beti- or behind the potentiality for being which it has understood. It guards itself against becoming too old for its victories, Nietzsche, free for its own most possibility, almost possibilities which are determined by the end and are so understood as finite. Endliche. Dasein dispels the danger that it may, by its own finer understanding of existence, fail to recognize that it is getting outstripped by the existence possibilities of others. Rather, it may explain these possibilities wrongly and force them back upon its own, so that it may divest itself of its own most factical existence. As the non relational possibility, Death individualizes, but only in such a manner that as the possibility which is not to be outstripped, it makes Dasein, as being with, have some understanding of the potentiality for being of others. There's a lot to say about these passages. Again, note the verb shattering, wrenching, shattering, the violence of the language here. Note the... um, reference to to Nietzsche, who appears sporadically, but importantly, in in being in time. Dasein is not too old for its victories. Dasein is at the right age. Dasein coincides with itself. I am my age, as it were. I'm not too old. I'm not too young. I am my age. And on this basis, that is only on this self-legislating, anticipatory aloneness, only as a singular 
individual that has submitted to the demand of finitude, can it connect with the being of others? So my authentic being with others is based upon my individual authenticity. We're going to see that logic uh, reappear later in Being in Time. On 309, 310, if you look at those pages closely, you'll see that the theme of anxiety comes back. It's linked back. Being towards death is linked back to the experience of anxiety. And anxiety keeps turning up in these pages like Banquo's ghost in Shakespeare's Macbeth. And indeed, later on in, uh, in, in the next chapter, uh, Heidegger is going to talk about conscience anxiety or gewissen angst, where he'll bring together anxiety as anxiety that is being towards death with the testimony of conscience. We get a, this is not, I'm now on page 310, uh, we get a refinement of the thinking of anxiety here. Being towards death is essentially angst. It's essentially anxiety. He says that on page uh, 310, about halfway down the page and towards the bottom of the page, anxiety keeps popping up. You'll say uh, the penultimate line on page 310, being towards death is essentially anxiety. Okay, that's clear. Being towards death is essentially anxiety. So that anxiety, which was anxiety before the nothing of being in the world, now is anxiety before the nothingness of possibility. Authentic Dasein is a nothing, but it's an anticipation of possibility as possibility. It is, this is the thought that we're going to have to refine in the next lecture. It's a deep thought in being in time. Just stay with it if you can. Authentic Dasein is nothing actual. It's nothing substantial. Authentic Dasein is a nullity. And this nothingness is not a freedom of movement. This nothingness is the movement of freedom. Freedom is wrenching oneself from the they, shattering oneself in relationship to average everydayness and rising up into anticipation, possibility. Why do I mention freedom? Well, freedom is how the chapter finishes on page 311. Heidegger says, this is page 311, the first full paragraph. He pulls all the pieces together. Uh, And I think this is really powerful, whether you like it or not. We may now summarize our characterization of authentic being towards death as we have projected it existentially. Anticipation reveals to Dasein its lostness in the they-self and brings it face-to-face with the possibility of being itself, primarily unsupported by concernful solicitude, but of being itself rather in an impassioned freedom towards death. Freedom towards death. A freedom which has been released from the illusions of the they and which is factical, certain of itself, and anxious. Freedom um, has not been really mentioned before. And now, suddenly, it arrives center stage. It's been alluded to before, but it's not really become a major theme. But notice here what uh, Heidegger does with freedom. Freedom is an impassioned freedom towards death. And what freedom means is to be released from the illusions of the they and freed for factical, self-certain anxiety. You can see why 
Heidegger in some ways or people might suggest that this is a little bit like the the cave in Plato's Republic, that freedom as a freedom from the they self is a, a pulling away, a wrenching away from the cave towards uh, towards something else. But there's also um, a deeper thought here, or, or what Heidegger is drawing on here is a very deep and a very ancient thought, which I've tried to write about over the years, which is the idea that to philosophize is to learn how to die. That philosophy is an ars moriendi, an art of dying. And um, there's an essay, a famous essay, as you will certainly know by Montaigne, called To Philosophize is to Learn How to Die. And in that essay, he talks about having formed the habit of having death constantly in his mouth in the food that he eats and the um, drink that he imbibes. The thought that he has, uh, Montaigne, which I find a fascinating thought, is that what characterizes human life is, is fear. And that fear is a fear of death. And that fear of death uh, makes us slaves. We're slaves to the fear of death. Insofar as we deny death, we flee from it. And Montaigne says, um, he who has learned how to die has unlearned how to be a slave. He who has learned how to die has unlearned how to be a slave. Namely, that freedom uh, consists and can only consist in the acceptance of our mortality, in the acceptance of the framing of our life by necessity, uh, determination by finitude. So a lot more to say about that. And obviously these, this line of thought feels particularly uh, apt and maybe particularly disturbing at this point. Another thing to notice here is that Heidegger's language really loosened up, loosens up in Division 2. He's more extreme, he's more uh, unbuttoned. Unbuttoned probably isn't a very good way of putting it. More extreme, more, um, more, more violent, more direct in Division 2. So, great. <laughs> but why is being towards death not enough? Why can't we end the book here? Heidegger concludes the chapter on a very interesting note, which, which turns to the distinction between the existential and the existential, and the problem of what he calls attestation or witnessing or testimony. So I won't go through this whole thing now, but there's a, there's a fascinating passage on page 311 where he talks about um, the next step in the argument. Namely, that everything that Heidegger has said, he says, is fine, existential ontologically. It's fine existential ontologically, but it lacks any ontical or existential attestation, testimony, evidence, witness. So Heidegger's thought in closing this chapter, closing this chapter, is that uh, being towards death is formally right in the way he's described it, described it. But we need to um, find some evidence, some testimony that allows us to internalize the demand of being towards death, to internalize the demand. And that language of demand appears on page 311. And it's... Um, italicized and repeated and fascinating. For those of you who have got an interest in this, I developed a whole theory of ethical experience, what I call my theory of ethical experience in a book called Infinitely Demanding. Uh, and it's based on two concepts, concepts of the concept of demand and the concept of approval. And um, the demand that Dasein 
makes of itself the demand that Dasein must make of itself to give ontical evidence to confirm or demonstrate its ontological structure is its own demand. And that demand is going to be the demand that takes place in the call of conscience. And conscience is not God calling to me, is not anybody else calling to me, it's me calling to me. And uh, that's what we're going to work out in the next chapter. So that's, um, that's the kind of, um, that's being towards death in, in Heidegger. And um, it's powerful stuff. It's, it's rich drink. Yet, yet, and this is what I want to move into now. As we're accustomed in reading Heidegger, Heidegger's text is full of exclusions, seemingly baroque, or as you say here, baroque distinctions, which chime oddly with the heroic, virile, edifying language of the later part of the chapter on being towards death. So I want to press a little bit in closing at the exclusions that Heidegger makes in his analysis of being towards time. So let's now look back, having completed the chapter, let's look back at the first part of the chapter and see what has been left out. I'm going to pass over paragraph 48, uh, which is interesting. Nothing in the book is that uninteresting. 48, where Heidegger gives a formal analysis of the categories of end and totality, and where he even mentions fruit, you might say. I'm sure you're thinking, what does Heidegger say about fruit? Why this strange silence about fruit and vegetables in Heidegger's work? Well, he talks about fruit in paragraph 48, so you can figure that out for yourself. Um, but I want to focus here on paragraph 47. And um, this brings me to a question that I want to raise to Heidegger, uh, which is a question where you'll see what the question is going to be soon enough. What Heidegger has excluded from the existential ontological analysis of being towards death is the possibility that Dasein can gain an experience of death from the death or dying of others the death or dying of others. What happens when another dies? Now, Heidegger sees this quite coolly, quite coldly on page uh, 281. He says, this is, these are the last words on page 281, last seven lines. And it's kind of almost chipper, almost kind of upbeat. Yet when someone has died, his being no longer in the world, if we understand it in an extreme way, is still a being, but in the sense of the being just present at hand and no more of a corporeal thing which we encounter. In the dying of the other, we can experience that remarkable phenomenon of being, which may be defined as the changeover of an entity from Dasein's kind of being, or life, to no longer Dasein. The end of the entity qua Dasein is the beginning of the same entity, Quay something present at hand. In the other's death, they're transformed from Dasein to no longer Dasein. Right? And that changeover, that transformation, is a transformation into becoming something present at hand. And that present at hand thing is a corpse. The other, the dead other, becomes a present at hand corpse, a mere corporeal thing, a lifeless material thing. When you die, you become a present at hand corpse, Heidegger seems to be saying. But, he admits, this approach does not access the phenomenal 
content of the dead one, right? The phenomenal content of the dead one. And he moves from the lifeless material corpse as present at hand to what he calls the deceased, der Verstorbene, who is mourned in funerals and commemorations. So where is the discussion of grief, mourning, funerals, commemorations in being in time? Well, it's really on page 282. That's where he talks about it. So when we are mourning the other, the dead other, when we're mourning the dead other, Heidegger says, although we're still with them, we're still with them, we cannot be said to experience the others dying in a genuine sense. We cannot be said to experience the others dying in a genuine sense. We are, he says, this is the penultimate line on page 2282, we are there alongside, or we are only alongside. So Heidegger acknowledges the that there is a place for mourning, firstly, for, for grief, but makes it secondary to my dying. In other words, the dying of others is not and cannot be a substitute for understanding my death. The dying of others cannot be a substitute for understanding my death. On 283, he makes precisely that point first full paragraph in 283, but above all, the suggestion that the dying of others is a substitute theme for the ontological analysis of Darzan's totality and the settling of its account. Ba, 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 ba. Um, that's, that's not going to work. Right. So, the stranger cannot stand in for my death and I cannot substitute myself for the other. The stranger cannot stand in for my death, and I cannot substitute myself for the other. In this way, Heidegger introduces the idea of the stranger as what he calls the representative. It's on page 203, the representative, in the sense of, let's say, a sales representative or a parliamentary representative. The claim he's making, which is incontestable, is that I cannot experience my wholeness, my possibility of being a whole in relation to the other's death. And this is the key passage. Listen carefully, if you would, at this point. This is the passage that I want to draw your attention to. And this passage was a passage that was um, at the heart of a paper, a talk, that was given in 1987 during the um, what was called the Heidegger Affair that was all the rage in Paris um, when the extent of Heidegger's attachment to national socialism became clear and uh, clearer than it had been previously. And a number of thinkers who were close to Heidegger or influenced by Heidegger were asked to um, you know, respond, and uh, there was lots of stuff in the newspapers, magazines. It was a big scandal in the way that the, the French um, still do best. Anyway, in this context, um, Emmanuel Levinas, my hero, Levinas um, was asked to give a a response um, in the form of a talk uh, organized by the Collège International de Philosophie. I think this was in some point in 1987 when I was a graduate student, actually. It was an important moment for me. And um, the, the talk that Levinas gave was called To Die For or Mourir Pour, Dying For. And Rather than respond to the, um, the question of Heidegger's Nazism, um, how Nazi he was, whether he was a little bit Nazi or a lot Nazi, Levinas doesn't 
respond to that directly. He's more discreet. He just reads this passage and looks at what it, the issue that it raises. So this is the passage that Levinas read in 1987. I want to read it to you. It's page 284. He says, Heidegger, and think of this, you know, um, coming out of the mouth of Levinas might be more helpful, dramatic, but it is kind of dramatic. So on 284, he says, however, however, this possibility of representing breaks down completely if the issue is one of representing that possibility of being which makes up Dasein's coming to an end and which as such gives to it its wholeness. No one can take the others dying away from him. Of course, someone can go to his death for another, but that always means to sacrifice oneself for the other in some definite affair. Such dying for can never signify that the other has thus had his death taken away, even in the slightest degree. Dying is something that every Dasein must take upon itself at the time. By its very essence, death is in every case mine, insofar as it is at all. And indeed, death signifies a peculiar possibility of being in which the very being of one's own Dasein is an issue. In dying, it is shown that mindness and existence are ontologically constitutive for death. Dying is not an event. It is a phenomenon which is to be understood existentially. It is to be understood in a distinctive sense, must still be more closely delimited. There's a lot I could say about that passage, but let me come at it in a slightly different way. The phrase I want to focus on, the phrase that Levinas just leaves hanging in the air, is that to die for another would just mean to sacrifice oneself for the other. The verb in German, sacrifice oneself, is the verb sich opfern, sich opfern. And an opfer is a, a sacrifice is a sacrifice. Another word for sacrifice, an older word for sacrifice, is, um, is holocaust. So to make oneself a sacrifice is, in a sense, to make oneself a holocaust. That, for Heidegger, would be secondary to uh, my death. Let me come at this question in closing in a different way. Okay, I'm going to change the tone and the approach, but come at the same matter in a slightly, a slightly different angle. So there are four criteria in Heidegger's full existential ontological conception of death. It's non-relational, certain, indefinite, and not to be outstripped. It's only the first of these criteria that I want to take issue with. The other three are true, if banal. It's certain that we're going to die, firstly. Secondly, the instant of our death is indefinite. We don't know when it's going to happen. And three, it's pretty damn important, right? not to be outstripped. But if the first of these criteria falls, or the first of these criteria can be placed in question, then the whole picture changes. Heidegger insists in the passage I just read on the, non, on the non-relational character of death, because for him, death is ontologically constituted through mindness and existence. Therefore, dying for another would simply be to sacrifice oneself for another or to substitute myself for another. Thus the fundamental experience of finitude is non-relational, and all relationality is rendered secondary because of the primacy of mindness. Remember, mindness, yemeinigkeit, is the first um, concept we saw in being in time. All 
the way back to the first pages of the existential analytic. Now, I want to oppose non-relationality, the non-relational character of being towards death, with the thought of the fundamentally relational character of finitude, namely that death is first and foremost experienced in a relation to the death or dying of the other and others, in being with the dying in a caring way and in grieving after they are dead. And such a relation to the other is not a relation of understanding. The other's dying is not like placing an intuition under a concept in Kant's epistemology. In other words, the experience of finitude opens up in relationship to the brute fact that escapes my understanding, escapes the reach of my criteria, as someone like Stanley Cavell would put it. The aspiration to wholeness, to totality, can be questioned. Perhaps the aspiration to totality should be given up. Deliberately twisting the example that Heidegger gives in paragraph 47, I would say, this is me speaking, this isn't Heidegger, this is me speaking, I would say that the fundamental experience of finitude is rather like being a student of pathological anatomy. Heidegger gives that example on uh, those words on the top of page 282. A student of pathological anatomy where the dead other is a lifeless material thing. He says that also on 282. With all the terrible lucidity of grief, one, watch, one watches the person one loves, parent, partner, child, stranger, die and become a lifeless material thing. That is, there is a thing, there is a thing, there is a corpse at the heart of the experience of finitude. And this is why I mourn. Antigone understood this well, it seems to me, staring at the lifeless material thing of her dead brother and demanding justice. No one else could die Antigone's death for her, yet she dies for another. She substitutes or sacrifices herself. Authentic Dasein, the problem with authentic Dasein, is that Dasein does not mourn. Authenticity, the logic of authenticity, makes the act of mourning secondary to my mindness, to Dasein's mindness. And this is why Heidegger can write, as he does uh, on page 282, we do not experience the death of others in a genuine sense. At most, we are there alongside. Now, if we challenge Heidegger on this point, as I would like to do, I mean, motivated or inspired by Levinas, we come to the view that death and finitude are fundamentally relational. That is, they're not non-relational, they're relational. They're constituted in a relationship to someone whom I love, something, if it's a corpse, someone that's become something that casts a long mournful shadow across the self and it and which undoes the self's authenticity. But if that's the case, if that thought can at least be floated, that there is a problem with Heidegger's analysis of being towards death, then this would also lead me to question a distinction that's fundamental to Heidegger's analysis of death, which we haven't talked about, this threefold distinction, but let me just mention it now. How do he make a threefold distinction? Threefold distinction. He talks about dying, firstly, one, dying, what he calls sterben, which is proper to Dasein, which is the very mark of Dasein's ownness. So dying is what Daseins do. One, two, what he calls perishing, 
perishing which is confined to plants and animals. And thirdly, what he calls demise, which Heidegger calls a uh, a zwischen phenomenon, a between phenomenon, between these two extremes of dying and perishing. Now, although one could question Heidegger on this point, is it the case that plants and animals simply perish? Um, I have my doubts, particularly when it comes to the higher mammals or indeed my beloved cephalopods like uh, octopuses and cuttlefish. But I think we have to leave open the possibility that certain animals die. They undergo dying and not just perishing, as Heidegger insists. I also doubt whether human beings are incapable of perishing. Is it not true that human beings can die, can perish, right? Or dying like a dog, as Kafka's fiction and the facts of war, famine, and global poverty insistently remind us? And what of those persons who die at the end of a mentally debilitating disease or who die whilst being in what is termed a permanently vegetative state, do they cease to be human on Heidegger's account? I think they, they do cease to be human on Heidegger's account. I think that's a, that's a problem. But more importantly, even than that, if finitude is fundamentally relational, that is, if it is by definition a relation to the fact of the other who exceeds my powers of projection, then the only authentic death is inauthentic. That is on my account, this is me speaking and not Heidegger, on my account, an authentic relation to death is not constituted through mindness, but rather through otherness. Death enters the world not through my own fear of death, but rather through my relation to the others dying. Perhaps even through my relation to the other's fear, which I try to assuage as best I can. This is what leads two thinkers to invert Heidegger's phrase. When Heidegger talks about death as the possibility of impossibility, Emmanuel Levinas and uh, Maurice Blanchot say rather, no, death is the impossibility of possibility, the impossibility of possibility. Death is that which shows something over which I have no power. I have no power over the other's death and I have no power over my own. Death is not a possibility of Dasein, but rather describes an empirical limit, a normative limit to all possibility and to all my fateful powers of projection. My relation to finitude limits my potentiality, my potency. It, we might say, in closing, the relational character uh, of finitude, the fact that my relationship to the other is primary, for, on, on my view, this impotentializes the self and disables the healthy virility of authentic Dasein, impotentializes the self and disables the healthy virility of authentic Dasein. I don't know what that beep was. Lord knows. So there is for me, um, there's a way, of, there's a problem here in Heidegger's analysis and the... I think Heidegger's understanding of the non-relational character of being towards death is, is a problem. I think Heidegger's being in time is um, too much of a hymn to potentiality, possibility, potency, and the rest. I also think that there are ways in which Heidegger's thinking can be redescribed that make a space for weakness for vulnerability, dependency, and the rest. But that requires some extra work. But the good news is that I'm finished. 
So that concludes the the first, you know, kind of virtual episode or virtual lecture. And um, thank you for listening if you made it through to the end. And I'm going to send this off to Zenon now and hopefully he'll clean it up and he'll then wing its way to you. Stay well, everyone. And Okay, bye-bye.